Like many young women growing up in Iran, Miriam found herself in an impossible situation. She had been engaged to a young man, but now he was threatening her life. And then at that point, I also found out that he was an arms dealer and he would threaten to kill my mother, my father, my brother, myself. And so after that, I attempted to take my life five different times. Yet Miriam found hope even in that desperate situation. We'll find out where she found that hope today on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help, right now on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Welcome again to The Voice of the Martyrs Radio. My name is Todd Nettleton, and we're going to hear a conversation that I recorded on the road. I'm actually not even going to tell you where we were, because that will make it safer for the lady that we're interviewing today. We're going to have a conversation with Sister Miriam, who is a gospel worker and a Christian believer inside the Islamic Republic of Iran. She has an amazing story of how God rescued her. Hang on, because you're going to be on the edge of your seat through this dramatic story. And for her security, we're not even going to hear Sister Miriam's voice. What you'll be hearing is the voice of an interpreter. That's in order to protect Sister Miriam, to protect our contacts inside Iran. We'll start by hearing how Miriam introduced herself. And I'm 30 years old. I grew up in a family of military, both my father and mother. They were part of the military for the Shah, and we were six children. And the way we grew up is we separated ourselves or ran away from them and didn't have relationship with them. And our mother taught us that God did not exist. And at 13 years old, I was able to convince anybody who asked me that God did not exist. And I also loved cars because that was what my father did. Then an incident happened when my father's partner, business partner, took me into his car and then he touched me. And this happened over and over again. And I was told I could never tell my father and I never did tell my father, but I told my mother. Sister Miriam's mother told her father about this abuse, but he didn't believe it. Instead, he accused his wife of trying to destroy his business. He said, So you made this whole story up so that you could get rid of my business partner and ruin me? So right in front of his business partner, he took his belt and the buckle of his belt and whipped her. And then right at that moment, I completely separated myself from my father and my heart. So just a few months before all of this occurred, my sister showed me a horror movie, and for three days, I lost my mind. And I would see, have a vision of my mom, angry, coming into my room every morning. It was a bad dream. It wasn't actually that my mom came in the room, but I had this vision of my mom angrily coming into my room every morning. And then at that point, I never hugged my mother and I never let her come close to me. And so even at that young age, I began taking anti-depression medicine. And because of that, for a whole year, I wasn't able to go to school. And so what ended up happening is that as a little girl, I would just hide in the corner and play with little statues. That was the only thing I knew to do. And so From that city, we left and went to the southern part of Tehran. At that point, we were so poor that we didn't even have water coming into our house. We had to go out to a well and get water for ourselves. And the school that I went to, it was so poor that it didn't even have any kind of air conditioning. And in the middle of the hottest part of the season, I went to school. And then when I became 15 years old, I was told by my father I had to go and start working. 
So even though at that point my father had regained some of his wealth, he didn't support us as a family and that's why he sent me to go work. And so I began sweeping the floor at a beauty salon just to have enough money to be able to survive. And then at some point my mom decided to take me to music classes because I was really shy and she was trying to get me to start opening up a little bit and be around other people and learn how to speak with them. And then it was suggested that I get into theater and my mom really encouraged me uh, saying that I would learn how to ha relate to other people. And so then I began working with this group in the theater and I really trusted them until after that one year when I was uh, at the learning theater, the person who was over that group invited me to come to the theater. Nobody was there, and he locked the door, and he was going to rape me. I, I became heartbroken, and especially from God, and I just ran away. And for an hour, I was just roaming the streets, yelling out to God, what did I do wrong that I would deserve such things? And it just proved to me over the years that God didn't exist. There was no God. Because even when I was five and six and I was yelling and calling out for him, he never heard my cries. And I would used to tell him, if you really are God, come and be my father. Because I didn't have a mother or father. When you were praying those prayers as a little girl, what what name did you use for God? Did you call him Allah? Did you call what what name did you pray to? Uh, the place where we lived was across the street from the beach, and because it was so big, I used to call that the beach or the ocean, God. And so every night I would talk to the to the ocean, and so that's when my depression actually got worse and continued, and I closed myself up in my room and only drank water. So uh, how old were you at this point? I was 17 years old. Okay. And then my mom took me to a psychiatrist and they prescribed me 12 pills that I took every day. In a 24 hour period, I slept for 18 hours of it. And nobody would come even to check on me. Uh, they didn't know if I was asleep or awake nobody really cared until somebody came into my life and I got engaged to him I realized that he himself had many problems emotionally and because I myself was emotionally damaged and he was too my depression increased and because of this physically I began showing signs and the blood vessels in my brain and behind my head burst. And my whole purpose was to break off the engagement of this with this man. And he told me, if you're not going to get married to me, I won't let you get married to anybody. So he made up a plan and sent three men with knives to come and cut me up on my face and my body. And right at that moment when these three men came and they parked their cars in such a way that I couldn't get past them, the police came from behind and got them. And that was the very first time I felt like God had saved me and got me out of a bad situation. And there was the very first seed that God existed and right at, that happened right at that moment. So how old were you when that happened? I was 19 years old. And so that night I had a dream and in that dream there was this black horse that was coming towards me and all of a sudden Jesus grabbed me out of the path of the horse and saved me. At this point in Miriam's story she's been introduced to hope through this dream about Jesus but her life was still very very bleak. Her mentally unstable fiancé set fire to her father's store. He was hoping to destroy not only Miriam's life, but also her family's life. And then at that point, I also found out that he was an arms dealer, and he would threaten to kill my mother, my father, my brother, myself. And then at, 
at one point then my reputation was completely destroyed in that village that we lived in that town that we lived and so after that I attempted to take my life five different times and one time I took all my pills and I became very ill and one of the family members found out and they took me to the hospital and I really got even worse off because not only was I having all these problems happen but I couldn't even kill myself my brother was an electrician and one of the wires that he would use in his business I took some of that wire and hid it under my bed and with that I hung myself and so as I prepared to hang myself I locked my door to the bedroom and I told God if you actually exist I want to touch you and I thought the only way to touch him was to die and touch him that way and at that point I had taken again all my medicine and then I hung myself so I really didn't feel anything and for four seconds I called out to Jesus to God and all of a sudden just like a little baby is held over the shoulder of the father I felt like I was over the shoulder of Jesus and I always desired to have been held like that by my father and I told him please don't put me down on the ground I'm scared to have my feet touch the ground and I wasn't even embarrassed, even though this was an, a man who I didn't even know. Because even back when I was five and six, after that first incident happened um, of that molestation, I hated men, and I didn't want any man touching me. And somehow I knew that he was Jesus. And he recited Psalm 91 to me. And of course, I didn't even know what Psalm 91 was. <laughs> And he told me, I won't even let your foot hit a rock, hit a stone, and I'm going to protect you. Trust me. And then at this point, I woke up from laying on my bed. And so I thought, okay, I, I didn't hang myself. And all I thought was, oh, well, I must have just dreamt about all this, that I didn't actually hang myself. And then I got up out of bed, and I saw my bedroom doors locked. And the noose that was around my neck, the wire that I had used, was completely opened and it was laying on the ground. And then I went and looked in the mirror and I saw that it all around my neck is bruised. And because for the past two years I had never been able to cry, for three hours straight, that's all I did was cry. And I knew that through crying, I was actually being healed. As we continue to hear this moving story from Sister Miriam here on The Voice of the Martyrs Radio, let me add a little detail sort of behind the scenes of this story. Miriam had been carrying so much stress that it had been causing physical symptoms. Her neck had been sore and swollen before this suicide attempt. She'd been to the doctors, but they hadn't been able to solve the problem. And then as I began crying... Even physically, I received healing in my neck. It now was going back to normal. And then I went outside of my bedroom and my mom saw me and she hadn't seen me laugh for over two years. And she called everybody, all my family, and said, come and look, my daughter's starting to laugh. And then after all this t time, that's when I discovered that the people who rented on the floor beneath us were Christians because they came to witness to me and share the gospel with me and I said oh I've already met Jesus and once when they had moved into our apartment building they said the very first person that we locked eyes on was me and they began praying for me the best part was right there in my own house where everybody had decided that God didn't exist, I'm talking about God to everybody. And they, my family began laughing at me and saying, we don't even know who she's talking about, but whoever it is, we accept that because look at how much I've changed. And I would pray to God at night and I would say, how can I share you 
with them. And then one time my aunt came and slept with me in my bedroom. And so in the morning she gets up and she starts running around the house and saying, Jesus is God. And I would run after her and I said, how did you find out? And what, that night when she spent the night in my room, Jesus had come and met her and began telling her who he was. And when she woke up, she knew that Jesus was God. And then the next one was my sister. She came to know Jesus. And after many years, at that point, she was able to forgive my father. Because before that, when my sister would talk about my father, all she could do is cry in pain. And then the next thing that happened is my brother saw Paul in a dream. So Paul touches my brother. And then the next thing he sees is the evil coming out of him. And then he came running to me and he said, who's Paul? So I opened up my Bible and I showed him, this is Paul. And I started reading the story about Paul. And right then, my brother accepted Jesus. And then once my mother saw how my brothers and sisters had completely changed, she told me, and everything that has happened to you, I know, is because of Jesus. Can you please tell me about Jesus? And I shared the gospel with her, and she came to know Jesus. Wow. And then the end of the story is that the whole apartment came to know <laughs> the Lord. Before you tried to hang yourself, you were taking 12 pills every day. Yes. And after that, you've taken no pills. No. And Actually, the doctors warned me that if I ever stopped taking that medication, it was possible I could go into a coma and actually die. And nothing's ever ha like that has happened to me. None of those incidents has ever happened to me. So what does it mean to you now that God is your father? So my uh, biological father has actually passed away. But truly, even when I was a very small child, I had lost my biological father. And I really needed someone who would protect me and be my father. And at that point, I started going after him. I'm looking for him, searching for him. And now that I'm serving God, I see that the enemy has really attacked the fathers in Iran. It, it's not just me. And there's even people who's fought their own fathers have raped them. And now that I know my father, my true father, and when I serve him, I say, I want others to know their real father, their true father. And that's what drives me to show his love to others, because I want them to know the true father. We're talking today on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Sister Mariam, this amazing story of, of how God brought her to faith inside the country of Iran. So your early ministry was reaching your apartment building. What does your ministry look like now today? So now I go out into the public and just my smiling and being happy and being full of joy draws other people to me. And they come and the very first question they have for me is, what's so different about you? Why are you so happy? Because I tell them, the Spirit of God is in me. And they say, what? Would you please explain that to me? And I say, okay, because everybody in Iran are very depressed. And oftentimes you can see on a young girl, 15 year old, 16, 17, they've tried to commit suicide by cutting their wrists. And we have a special hospital in Iran, those who attempt suicide, they take them to this hospital. And there's not even one single bed that's even empty. There's that many who have tried to commit suicide. And many times we go to share the gospel there. Mariam, as we finish up our conversations on VOM Radio, we like to help people to pray. So I, wanna, I want you to help us know how to pray for the country of Iran, both for the church there and for unbelievers there. So the first thing that we need prayer for, for everyone who is in Iran, is that their hearts would be prepared and open 
for the gospel because now we're in a situation where nobody trusts one another and we truly as those who are Christians are asking God for his favor that other people would actually trust us and for the grace to be honest to be able to share the gospel. Do you ever feel fear about being arrested or being persecuted or do, are you afraid as you do this ministry? Once we decided to serve the Lord this way, we know what country we live in. We know where we live, but what, with what government and what will, could ever happen to us. We know all these things. And every day, my husband and I, we always say goodbye as if it could be the last time. But this is a choice we've made. We've given our lives completely to God, and that's the choice my husband and I have chosen. So, of course, we always walk with wisdom from God. We always ask for His wisdom. But no matter what, it's a choice we've made, and we're glad to make it. Fear really doesn't have any meaning for us because we've made our decision. It's already made. It could be a daily choice, but we've already made that decision, so nothing can really happen to us that we haven't already thought of and that we haven't already decided on, and that's that's the last part of fear. You just heard Sister Maria mention her husband, and I know some of you are thinking, wait a minute, we heard earlier how she hated men. As a growing believer, she still struggled with bitterness toward men. But then God brought a godly man into her life. And in a dream, Miriam became convinced that she was called to say yes to his invitation and marry him. But her heart wasn't completely healed until she dealt with the horrible treatment that she'd received as a six-year-old girl. And every day I used to pray that my heart, every part of me would be healed. And then when my father passed away and the man that used to be his business partner who uh, molested me, I saw him at my father's funeral. He had grown quite old. He had a young girl himself, a daughter. And from the depths of my heart, I completely forgave him. And that's when God spoke to me in my heart. I brought him here to this funeral so that you would forgive him. And for the very first time in my life, I could pray for him and bless him. And then that's when I was completely healed. So we have people who listen to VOM Radio who are trying to forgive something, someone who wronged them. How would you advise them to, to get better or to, to get closer to being able to forgive? Well, first of all, the reason why I couldn't forgive my father was because I judged him. And for a full month, I prayed. And as memory after memory of my childhood would come, I began crying. And that's when God would speak to my heart. And he would share with me, if you were in the place of that man, what would you do? How would you feel? And he would bring up memories and ask me questions asking me, what do you think happened to your father that he's now acted like this and your father doesn't know me, but you know me and that's all it took. I repented for having judgments against my father and then I forgave him from the bottom of my heart. Mariam, it's such an honor to meet you and thank you so much for sharing your story here on Voice of the Martyrs Radio. And I just thank you. I just want to give glory to God because actually Jesus has saved me one time from death and now for eternity. Amen. I want to encourage you, if you're just now joining us, go to vomradio.net and listen to this entire conversation with Sister Miriam. You will definitely want to hear her whole story. Again, that website, vomradio.net. You can also find this conversation in our podcast stream. Just look for the VOM Radio podcast. I also want to encourage you this week, will you join me to pray for the nation of Iran? God is doing amazing things inside the Islamic Republic of Iran. But those amazing things are coming with a cost for our brothers and sisters there. They are facing danger. They are facing challenges. So will you pray for the church inside Iran this week? And I hope you'll be back with us next week. We're going to hear how gospel workers are traveling around the world 
to offer hope to people just like Miriam who need to know Jesus Christ. I know you'll be encouraged by that story. So be back next week right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.